You know, it's been said that the number one topic for writers is writing about other writers. And I think it's kind of true of journalists. We like interviewing other journalists. Case in point, my next guest, Eric Jansen, founder and host of Out in the Bay. Welcome. Thanks, David, for having me here. Now, I was thinking, gosh, you've been doing this a couple years, but you said you've been doing it. It's going to be eight years in October. We first went on the air, I think it was October 7th, 2004. Wow, and you can hear this all throughout Northern California on KALW, the NPR station, correct? Right, well, broadcast in the Bay Area on 91.7 FM, uh -huh. KALW, and it's available, of course, worldwide on KALW.org, and we have podcasts on our own website, outinthebay.com. There you go. So. Now, you've had a long career in journalism. Before you came to be the uh, host of Out in the Bay, what was your trajectory? Well, I started in Santa Cruz County. I was volunteering for one of the local radio stations there. Okay, we can go back even farther. My mom actually worked for KPFA radio when I was a kid. Uh -huh. She wasn't on air, but she was the bookkeeper there, and the radio was on all the time. So I, I learned the K KPFA pledge phone number before I learned <laughs> my own phone number. Yeah. But I guess that kind of put radio in my blood. I did a little journalism in high school. I didn't really think of it as a um, realistic career choice, and perhaps I sh that was the wise thing to, th to have thought. <laughs> it's not a lucrative <laughs> career. But so after college, I, I somehow thought, oh, maybe I should check into journalism. And I went to grad school after that and started working for, uh, came back and was a freelance reporter for KQED for a number of years and for National Public Radio. Right, I remember your reports. And then I went on to Minnesota Public Radio. I was there for uh, two, about two and a half years and then worked for a uh, newspaper there, did some online and news reporting for, um, for one of the community newspapers there which couldn't quite make up their mind whether they wanted to be a gay paper or just an alternative paper. But, mm -hmm. uh, anyways, and what is the uh, difference? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I think uh, in their case, it was called Siren. And they wanted to try something new and different. And uh, it was founded by a lesbian, but I don't think she was a little uncomfortable, didn't know if a gay paper would really succeed in Minneapolis at that time. Mm -hmm. And the, this is the, the 80s, folks, right? Uh, this was actually uh, late 90s, 99. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the people, the ad sales people told me they had a hard time selling it because if they could say it's a gay paper and just be very straightforward about it, it would have been much easier. Mm -hmm. Anyway, live and learn. Well, you know, that, that raises an interesting question. Nowadays, what is a quote-unquote gay show? I mean, here we're on an LGBT TV show you host out in the Bay. Nowadays, in the age of a president saying, I'm for same-sex marriage and all the stuff that's going on, is it all just part of the same mix? Is it just a niche versus uh, an activist statement? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's a debate in the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association mm -hmm. we had for a long time. You know, is this activist journalism? Can you be gay and cover gay issues uh, objectively? And, of course, you know, I think that would be like saying, well, a black person can't cover um, a civil rights march because right. they wouldn't be objective. I mean, that's, that's just crazy. But I actually have sort of accepted that, in a way, I am being an activist with this show. I'm, what I feel like we're doing is we're getting on the stories of gay and lesbian people and trans people and bisexual people. Mm -hmm. We're getting those stories on the air in a way that other people can listen to them and learn in a way that's not right in their face. They get to, they can, in the privacy in their own home, they can listen in to our stories and our lives. And, right. and in a way, to me, that, that advances civil rights because it, it just breaks down ignorance. Well, and sometimes, you know, um, activism comes in, in strange wrappings. I remember the first March on Washington back in the early 1990s, and the late, great Leroy Ahrens, then the editor of the Oakland Tribune, the eventual founder of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association, he's the one who brought it to the attention of the editors of Newsweek and the Washington Post and said, hey, guys, uh, and mainly was a bunch of white guys running the right. press in, um, we just had about a million people on the mall why isn't this considered newsworthy? Right. And they had to step back and realize, wow, I guess that is a bias that we weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you still consider sometimes that with your show, not only are you doing activism, but you're doing education within the journalistic community? Well, perhaps to some extent. I think that it sort of surprised me, honestly, when we brought the show to KLW, that there was no other currently existing weekly show on public radio in the Bay Area, of all places, mm -hmm. about gay issues. That didn't add up. There had been one on KPFA for a long time, but for various reasons that, that went away. So I, you know, I don't know. It's really hard to, to, to know how much respect I'm getting from other journalists. I run into lots of people in the community who, gay and straight, who, yeah. have, who listen to the show, and they enjoy it, and they tell me they enjoy it because, they, like I said before, they feel like they're listening in to conversations that they might not necessarily feel comfortable having with their gay friend or mm -hmm. um, their gay son or something like that. But, uh, but when they hear it, you know, 
just in, as they're going about their daily lives, that's right. somehow more accessible for them. How important has been the growth of social media to your radio show? I mean, I remember 10 years ago, well, not even 10, five years ago, um, I thought, well, TV is going to change. This is not going to be the sort of TV we had. Radio is going to go away. Of all of those things, I mean, present company accepted, radio seems to be the medium that has kept along. We still have cars. We still have things mm -hmm. we put in our ears while we're on Stairmaster or whatnot. Radio seems to me, personally, to be the one news form that has changed the least as far as uh, listener acceptance. What do you think? I think that's accurate to say. I mean, when television came along, they said, oh, radio's going to die. Well, it didn't die. Mm -hmm. And radio's still very strong. Um, however, I, you know, I, th I think that social media has taken, you know, taken a little bit away from radio. Radio is maybe not quite as strong as it was, but I do think it will, it will remain. Now, you asked about social media, how we're using it. I don't think, I, I think we could do a better job of using social media. We do have a Facebook page, Out in the Bay, mm -hmm. uh, spaces between the words, Out in the Bay. <laughs> yeah. You can find us on Facebook that way. Uh, we need to use that more than we do. We need to keep it more active, but that it takes time. Yeah, you know, we're we're a small staff. Do so. you think social media is media now, or you know, is it, are we still in the age when social media is considered new media, or is it just media? Uh, my, I guess my concern about social media is, I don't know how reliable the information presented is. I don't think it follows journalistic standards. And you may get a lot of information there, and I think it's like, maybe there's a whole thing like, for example, Egypt, with the uh, protests starting and uh, mm -hmm. mobilizing people via Facebook and other social media methods. That's, that's new, but I don't think we can rely on it as a source of information right. all the time. Since your days uh, in Minnesota Public Radio and all your other work that you've described, how have your journalistic, I don't want to say standards, but your journalistic touchstones changed, or have they? Hmm. Well, I'm a journalist in a different sort of way than I was before. I was really a, a reporter. I was covering uh, city politics and the environment. Now I'm doing a talk show, which is it's journalistic, but it's a very different style. I just is it more like freeing? I, I think so. It's just like I feel like I can just go and talk to someone and learn about their lives and uh, and I have to be careful of the facts, of course, but I don't have to research everything because they're the expert. Right, right. <laughs> so you can ask some questions you couldn't ask before. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me ask another question. How did your coming out impact you as a journalist? Wow. And do you remember that? Uh, I do. I was, I was reporting for KQED as a general assignment reporter, uh, excuse me, as a, well as a freelancer doing mm -hmm. general assignment reporting. And I didn't come out until I was about 30. So I'd already been working for KQED off and on for a few years in freelancing. And then when I came out, they'd like, oh, you're the gay reporter, so now we're going to give you all the gay stories, uh, which was nice in many ways. It was interesting, and it, and they, it was... Uh, but didn't that kind of, did that offend you a little bit? Sometimes. Sometimes I kind of felt like, oh, I'm not the only one who can cover these things, and there's other things that I can cover. Mm -hmm. But I appreciated the fact that they wanted to, to go in that direction, and they wanted, they wanted to put more of our stories on the air. Mm -hmm. You've seen a lot reporting here in the Bay Area for a number of years, before you were out and then out at KQED. Um, certainly, to stretch an analogy, San Francisco is one of the epicenters of the LGBT movement. What do you think are the most important stories you've covered, specific to the LGBT issues over the mm. last 15 years of your career? Well, a couple pop to mind. One is the whole flap over the Boy Scouts and the United Way's funding of the Boy Scouts back in, uh, I don't honestly remember what year that was. Mm -hmm. It must have been early to mid-90s. And I remember um, kind of, uh, well, I made arrangements beforehand to go to Camp Casadero up in the, near the Russian River area, which is actually where a lot of the troops from Berkeley, not my troop, but mm -hmm. my brother's troop went to that camp. And I remember going there, and when I arrived, the guy who had set and it up... And you were a Boy go, Scout. I had been a Boy you Scout. Had, you yes, had, so been, I had a been a Boy Scout. Scout. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, um, so when I arrived there... The guy who was the liaison said, uh, I got a call from headquarters uh, since you left, you know, and this was in the days before cell phones. At least I didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, uh, we're not, uh, we, I can't let you on after all. But I said, I just drove all this way. And he's like, well, all right, but you never saw me here. So he let me go in. And I talked to all these parents and, you know, parents and kids. And, and for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, parents were like, I don't understand what the big flap is. This is ridiculous. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going with that because I don't yeah. remember the original question. No, well, you, you were talking about oh, the, 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 the biggest stories. stories, and you said well, the I Boy was, Scouts yeah, flap. Yeah. To me, that seemed important because you know it was it was in the it was in the news so much, and it just sort of 
made people, I think it made people step back and say, listen, the parents don't care. Why does this why, organization why are we care? Making, why is the why organization are we making a story changed? out of it? Yeah. And my recollection as a Boy Scout was, mm -hmm. one of the, part of the Boy Scout motto was to... Um, um, Thrifty, brave. Yeah, yeah, all those things. And there was one about uh, oh, morally straight. That's yes, what it was. That's, that's it. the phrase they caught on, morally straight. That didn't mean sexually straight. Mm -hmm. but, you know, so anyway. It's just, it just showed to me how an organ, any organization can be sort of taken over mm -hmm. by, you know, they change over time and they can be taken over by whoever's in, in, in charge at that time. You know, some people have said that um, the focus on same-sex marriage over the last few years has kind of, and I'll use this word, hijacked some other, not more meaningful, but other meaningful uh, LGBT stories, i.e. it suddenly seemed like every gay person wanted to be married. Do you or think, join the military. Or join the military, that's right. We either want to get married or go into the military. Do you think that those two stories specifically have been pushed to the detriment of other other issues? I think that there may perhaps have been an overemphasis on that. I think it's it's a it's a totally absolutely legitimate story. And I think that marriage is one of those things where our rights are denied because we can't get married. We're not, and if we can get married in the state that we live in, it's not recognized by the federal government, and that causes a lot of problems. There's mm -hmm. no question about that. But yeah, it seems like that's, especially a lot of the national gay organizations have focused so much of their attention on that, they're not, you know, not looking at other things that much. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, with the other things? Well, you know, there's still at. job protections mm -hmm. uh, for gay and transgender people. Um, that's, that leaps to mind. Housing issues, um, you know, and just horrific gay bashings, the transgender killings. We just had another we one just, here uh, this no, year. That's right. Yeah. So... Um, you know, I think it's important, but it's not. It's certainly not the only thing. One of the guests I've had on that I think is really interesting is a guy named, um, and he presents as a guy, but he goes by Matilda Bernstein Sycamore, mm -hmm. and he is an unabashed uh, anti-assimilationist. And uh -huh. He's written books saying, "Hey, you know, why shouldn't I dress with a pink shirt and green pants, and um, I'm still a man, and I can call myself Matilda, and so mm -hmm. what?" <laughs> and that's his point. Yeah. Do you think the whole issues of gender have really become sometimes even uncomfortable to quote unquote gay activists. I mean, for instance, um, when I came out, it was like, well, you're the gay or you're not gay. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yes, of course, the women are lesbian. Right. Oh, well, I guess there are these people called bisexuals. I had never met a member of the transgender community until I came to San Francisco. I feel like my track has been about education within my community. Right. Do you think a lot of gender politics have really, not splintered, but caused a lot of reflection within the LGBT movement? I do think so. I think that, you know, the, the emergence of the transgender movement, for example, I think has really opened up a lot of people's uh, minds to, it, you know, we don't have, it doesn't have to be, you know, so... so We're not all Kenzie Sixers. Yeah, it's not all six or zero. It's not all black and white. There's all these shades of gray in between. And I think that's actually really refreshing. Um, <laughs> All right, I'll share a personal story. Yes, please I was do. dancing at, at, at Gay Pride. Uh, yes. I love to do go the gay country western dance area. Uh -huh. I was dancing with this lesbian, shadow dancing, and she's dancing with me. And shadow dancing, if you don't know, it's 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 you're sort of back to back. The leader is behind the person uh -huh. dancing. And she's like, I'm getting a tingle. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, a lesbian and gay man can actually have some kind of like. You know, um, I don't know. It's Male not female bonding, but not well, sexual. Yeah. yeah, or it could maybe. So, what if there's a little teeny tiny bit of a sexual tinge? Uh -huh. It's not like, oh my God, I'm bisexual. I'm, I'm going back to, <laughs> I'm going to be straight again. What's happening? You know, so uh, I think it's refreshing. Right. Now, in our last few moments, tell us again when we can hear you and where we can hear you. Yeah, uh, Out in the Bay airs every Thursday night at 7 o'clock on KALW 91.7 FM here in the Bay Area and online at that same time on KALW.org. Also, um, our website, outinthebay.com, where you can get free podcasts and sign up Thanks for so Stitcher. Thanks so much. Listen in to Eric Jansen on Out in the Bay, and I hope next week you'll tune in to watch me, David Perry, on 10%. We'll see you next week.